the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. I'm privileged to serve St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, St. Luke's Covington, and Trinity St. John Lutheran School, Nashville. Thank you for tuning into our Bible class. Today we continue our study of Matthew chapter 1. Let's begin with prayer. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come and help us by your might, that the sins which weigh us down may be quickly lifted by your grace and mercy. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is useless, and without your light, our search is in vain. By the power of your Holy Spirit, invigorate our study of your Holy Word that by due diligence and right discernment, we might be established in our faith and help others in their faith as well. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Last week, we introduced Matthew, the tax collector of Capernaum, called to be one of Jesus' 12 disciples and to write this gospel. We summarized the structure of the book of Matthew. And now let's hear again Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, because we really didn't finish this yet. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliod, and Eliod the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen, and Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Last week I mentioned how precious this section is to people of a tribal background in Africa. Here's the complete story from Pastor David Federowitz, a missionary with Lutheran Bible translators. Pastor Federowitz shared about a woman from the Kamba people, K-O-M-B-A, in Ghana, in West Africa, and her love for this chapter. Now, these days when Bible translators do their work, they're able to make portions of the Bible available in smartphone apps. Now, there are people who can't read, but they can listen to the Bible newly available in their language. And these apps will read the biblical text to you. One woman, when she got the app, kept listening to Matthew chapter 1 over and over and over again. Now, we would find that strange since we don't get the full 
meaning of genealogies. But in that part of West Africa, it's not uncommon to know your ancestors going back eight generations. Well, here with Jesus, you have 42 generations, almost 2,000 years. This shows Jesus has a real family. The events of his life are rooted in real history, and you can believe that he really lived for us. And last week, we also spent quite a bit of time talking about Abraham, one of the two great anchors in this family tree. Abraham was called by God to go to an unspecified country through journeys to places unknown to him and that God would tell him when he got there. And God promised to make him into a great nation. Abraham believed all this and packed up all his things and left everything that was familiar. With all his possessions and his livestock and with all the people in his entourage, he began the long journey to Canaan, the promised land of which his descendants finally took possession over 400 years later. He was the founding father of the nation of Israel, that nation by which all nations on earth, even every family, are blessed with the Savior. It all came to be because Abraham believed the promises that God had told him. In a sermon on Matthew chapter 1, Pastor Lee Hagan applies this to our lives today. He says that during World War II in England, the most ominous sound one could hear was the air raid siren. For a nine-month period between 1940 and 1941, the Germans attacked Britain's airfields and then cities with nightly bombing raids. The sound would start softly, but would continue until it reached a spine-tingling trumpet sound. The constant threat of the sirens over those months led to dread every evening as the sun would set. It was during that time that Reverend Eric Milner White was serving as Dean of the famed King's College at Cambridge. Understanding the fear that gripped the people, he wrote a prayer befitting the people's uncertainty. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. These words describe the uncertain path that Abraham walked as he trudged toward a new unseen land. But he walked by faith, not by sight. He walked forward, trusting that God was leading him and with his love supporting him. In our gray and latter days, we are beset by so many and great temptations. Life in this fallen world means the threat of mental sirens blaring. That threat is always there for us. For us, they do not call for impending bombs, but hearken the same fears as we worry about doctor's appointments, car repairs. We live with anxiety over our uncertain future for our kids and our grandkids. But God forgives us for our fears and doubts for the sake of Jesus. The Holy Spirit sanctifies and keeps us in the true faith, even when all around us are things that could drive us to despair. Our confidence is that God has made us sons and daughters of Abraham by faith in Jesus. For we too are looking forward to a better country, the heavenly one, the land of promise, we face each day, therefore, with good courage as we walk by faith, not by sight, and as we wait for the fulfillment of the promised land that lies ahead in the resurrection on the last day. So we are bold to claim Abraham as our father, not because of something special about him, but rather that like him, we believe the precious promises of God. Thank you, Pastor Hagen. It all reminds me of the children's song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Now we turn our attention to the other main character in the family tree, and that would be David. 
Recall that David was a shepherd boy in Bethlehem, keeping the sheep of his father Jesse. Saul, the first king of Israel, had repeatedly been unfaithful to the Lord, rebelling against clear and specific instructions that God gave to him through the prophet Samuel. This unfaithfulness grieved Samuel greatly. The Lord regretted that he had made Saul king. Samuel had to tell Saul, Your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. That's 1 Samuel 13. And in 15, after another incident, Saul tells him, Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. David was indeed a man after God's own heart, anointed to be king over God's people. When Samuel went to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons, David was out in the field with the sheep. None of David's seven older brothers were chosen, though they were strong and tall and very impressive looking. But God was looking at the heart, and he saw that David had a heart that sought the Lord. And in 1 Samuel 17, we read, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that is David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And it was in the power of that Holy Spirit that David fought the giant Goliath. We read about that in the next chapter, 1 Samuel 18. That's the victory that made King Saul jealous. And David had a long period of trials and testing as Saul hunted him as a criminal, even though David had done nothing wrong. It makes us think of Jesus anointed with the Holy Spirit, a true Mashiach or anointed one that is a Messiah or a Christ, an innocent man persecuted by those who hated him. Finally, after Saul was killed in battle, David took the throne as king, first over the tribe of Judah for seven years and then over all 12 tribes for 33 years. And after God had given him rest from all his enemies, he told the prophet Nathan, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. This is in 2 Samuel 7. So it bothered him that the ark of God, which marked God's gracious presence among the people of Israel, that was still in that tabernacle, that, that tent, hundreds of years old, that went back to the days of Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness. At first Nathan said, do what is in your heart. In other words, go ahead and build a temple for the ark. But that night, God spoke to Nathan, who then went back to David with a message from the Lord the next day. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to live in? The Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. And of course, the Lord means a dynasty, a family of kings. Nathan goes on, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's 2 Samuel 7. Now these promises to David are very important for us to understand Matthew. They were celebrated in the Psalms and repeated in the, the prophets. Take a look at Psalm 89. It's a long Psalm written by a man named Ethan, singing of God's promises to David. It includes these words, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. 
And in Isaiah 11, for example, and uh, this is familiar in the Advent season, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And finally, Ezekiel goes so far as to call Jesus a new David. Writing hundreds of years after David died, to those exiles deported to Babylon, God, through Ezekiel, relays his promise about his people. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. That's in Ezekiel 34. And again in chapter 37. My servant David shall be king over them. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. So from these scriptures, you can see the, the hopes and dreams of the people of Israel that another David would come, a son of David, to rule over God's people. Now, David was only one of many kings mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, but they're all shadows directing our attention to Jesus, the real king, the one anointed king over all, for all people of all time, that is, all believers. Now, the music students at Christ the Rock Lutheran High School in Centralia recently recorded a hymn about the Savior King in his reign. It's called, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. The students were battling colds and other ailments that day, but they did a fine job under the direction of Mrs. Denise Hennig, who also accompanied them on the piano. For some 400 years, at least 14 generations, sons and grandsons of David ruled on the throne in Jerusalem. Then came the deportation to Babylon, and it seemed as though the promise came to an end. But Matthew in the Gospel is going to explain to us how the promises to David came true through Jesus. He is true God and true man, descended from David according to human flesh, but also God from all eternity ruling over God's people forever. Indeed, in the kingly office of Christ, God's promises to David are true now and for all eternity. If you compare Matthew's genealogy with the writings in the Old Testament, you will see that Matthew does do some editing. He wants to take the, the messy history of David's line 
so full of sin and faithlessness, rebellion, and the turmoil that resulted. And he wants to show how it all nicely fulfills God's perfect plan. He summarizes, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. You see, in spite of all the troubles caused by sin, God in his mercy and grace has fulfilled his promises and brought to us Christ our King at just the right time and in just the right way. Well, there's another feature of this family tree that has caught the eye of many. It's no secret that ancient Israelite culture was very heavily dominated by the male side of things. But Matthew decides to bring in four women, of course, in addition to Mary, the mother of our Lord. Thirty years ago, there was an article in the Lutheran Witness about this very thing. It was called, Who Put Them In There? And I'd like to read from that article written by Pastor John Timmy. He compares Matthew chapter 1 to a family picture album for Jesus. He says, Matthew's genealogy is rarely read and even less often studied. We may not look too closely at this part of scripture, but when we do, we're in for a few surprises, both puzzling and pleasant. The first surprise is the discovery that there are four women mentioned in the listing of names. First, there is Tamar, Judah's wife. We read of her in Genesis 38. And by the way, this is a chapter that we skip when we read for younger audiences, even in fifth and sixth grade. Uh, Judah, the son of Jacob, who was the grandson of Abraham, Judah was to arrange a marriage between his third-born son and Tamar, who was the widow of his first and second-born sons. There was a custom for doing this, later described as a Leverite marriage. That means brother-in-law marriage in Deuteronomy 25, which required that in the event of the death of a childless husband, the brother next in line must be married to his widowed sister-in-law. This practice sought to ensure that the name of the dead brother will not be blotted out from Israel, from Deuteronomy 25. Judah, perhaps superstitious that Tamar was an unlucky bride, she had, after all, buried two of his sons already, which we know was, in fact, due to the wickedness of the sons, Judah decided to delay his third son's marriage to her. And at this point, one might well have expected Tamar to say, well, I guess that's it. There's no chance I'll ever marry again into Judah's family. But Tamar had more gumption than that. She decided she would trick Judah into arranging a marriage, and not with the third son, but with Judah himself. She dressed as a prostitute to trick Judah, by Judah's own admission later, she was more righteous than he, and by this union, twins were born, including Perez, the ancestor of our Lord. And then there's Rahab. Rahab enters the Bible's story as the sympathetic madam of a brothel in Jericho. Well, as a testimony to her faith in the Lord, the God of Israel, she safely hid Israelite spies sent by Joshua to scout out the would-be promised land. And she is indeed listed as a hero of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. The next woman's picture in the Lord's family photo album carries far less scandal, but just as much interest. It is Ruth. Although praised for her great faith and abiding loyalty, Ruth would have been classified nonetheless as a foreigner. She was not born into the family of Israel. She was a Moabitess, and as such did not grow up worshiping the God of Israel. That's very clear. She came to faith in the true God, however. The Jewish expectations of the Messiah in Jesus' time looked for the chosen one of God to come from and be for the people of Israel exclusively. How strange to find this picture of a foreign woman in the son of David's family album. 
And speaking of David, we come next to the fourth woman's picture in Matthew's genealogy. That would be Bathsheba, simply called the wife of Uriah in verse 6 of Matthew 1. She came upon the biblical scene as an adulteress. Her subsequent marriage to David was in time blessed with the birth of Solomon, our Lord's ancestor. Nevertheless, her relationship with David began in adultery, led to the murder of Bathsheba's husband Uriah, and finally to the death of Bathsheba's and David's firstborn child. You can read about that in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And now, in fairness to Bathsheba, we should note that the scripture lays the blame for this sin squarely at the feet of David, who abused his power and authority to initiate this relationship with the wife of one of his most faithful commanders, Uriah. Yet the very mention of her brings to mind all this series of events. It's the kind of thing most of us would like to skip over when we tell our family history. But there it is. Inspired by the Spirit, Matthew has put that in there. Now, in gathering the pictures to put in Jesus' family album, Matthew had many choices. But inspired by the Spirit, he chose to include pictures of these four women. Dr. Martin Luther said in a sermon on this very chapter that these are mentioned for the reason that we should see how God desired to present to all sinners a mirror that Christ was sent to sinners and wanted to be born of sinners. Indeed, the greater the sinners, the greater the refuge they should have with the merciful God, in whom and in no one else we may find the law of God fulfilled and receive God's grace. And so Pastor Temi concludes, No matter how great our sin may be, the Son of God and Mary's Son, the descendant of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, is greater still. In him all our sins are washed away. Regardless of how others may look at us, God sees us as pure as the fresh winter snow. We can give thanks that God's ways are not our ways. Matthew is here showing us that Jesus has come for all sinners of all nations, no matter who you are or what you have done, male or female, young or old, married or single, God wants to paste your picture into his family album through faith in Jesus, his son, the one who was numbered with the transgressors on the cross, but raised again that we might be declared not guilty before God. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, Illinois. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of the Bible. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's, where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Here's a shout out to the men at the Centralia Correctional Center. God bless and keep you. I plan to be there this Thursday for Lutheran study and, and worship beginning at 8.30 a.m. We thank our sponsors and our faithful partners at V1047. And thank you all for listening.